You thought you knew what the fast lane was. Think again. Imagine a super highway designed for speed. Thousands of miles of roadway unhindered by limits of any kind. Where drivers can go as fast as their Porsches will carry them. Now, the Autobahn on Modern Marvels. Speed. It's dangerous, exhilarating, intoxicating, and illegal beyond clearly set limits that are posted on every major highway in the world, except one. It's midnight at a gas station just off the German Autobahn in southern Bavaria. We are about to live out every armchair speedster's fantasy to push the needle on the speedometer as far as it will go. In this car, the needle's going to go pretty far. This car you see here was a car from Great Britain, and the customer brings it to us as a stock 996 Turbo with 420 horsepower, and uh, we converted this car to 520 horsepower. Hans Lieb is a test driver for Roof Automotive a boutique car company that converts high-end Porsches into the fastest street-legal cars in the world. Everything about these cars, from the low-friction tires to the super-sensitive suspension to the massive engine, has been designed for Autobahn joyrides. The roof car is definitely designed for the Autobahn because the roof car is uh, so fast that it can only be driven such speeds on the Autobahn. You cannot do that on a normal two-lane highway. Hans has to certify exactly how fast this $200,000 Porsche can go before sending it to its owner in London. The Autobahn is the ideal place and the only major highway in the world where he can legally make this kind of test run. The Autobahn for us is a good road to test at all our cars. We have mostly no speed limit and also it's in a, in a really good condition. So it's really safe to test cars in this way by night. First you learn slowly to walk and then you learn faster to walk. And so it's the same impression you had with speed. Of course it's fun to go really, really fast with cars. So, but at the end you must be always really careful and all your eyes must be watching all around, so also by side and also in front a little bit. At this speed, even the super smooth surface of the Autobahn, specially maintained to accommodate really fast drivers, feels rough and pitted. And the slow and gentle Autobahn curves, designed to allow drivers to reach and hold extreme speeds, strain the Porsche. The hardest part at that speed is if you see cars in front of you and you are not really sure how they react. Sometimes they are sleeping and they turning to the middle line. So you must be really sure that the line is clear and uh, that is not a car who ma can make something wrong in front of you. You must be really concentrated at, at that speed because the car runs uh, over two or three hundred meters per second. This 520 horsepower Porsche tops out at 7200 RPMs and 212 miles per hour. That's with a camera crew of two squeezed into the side and rear bucket seats. Welcome to the Autobahn, the only freeway in the world where 212, a speed that police helicopters can't match, is perfectly legal. This is the ultimate driver's fantasy land not just for professionals, but for anyone with a license. A kind of bizarro world where all the basics are in reverse. 
it's actually illegal to drive too slow. But there are no limits at all for thousands of miles of Autobahn on how fast you can go. Hard as it is to get used to, it's actually okay to pass a cop here at speeds that would land you in prison in the U.S. There is that initial hesitation the first time you see the Autobahn police. And I remember talking to my friends and saying, you know, well, we can't get a ticket, can we? And then just simply passing and, you know, them at, you know, like 110 miles an hour, they never gave us a second look because we weren't doing anything illegal. The Autobahn turns the basic premise that speed kills on its head. Weird and counterintuitive as it seems, driving without limits, at least as it's practiced in Germany, is as safe and possibly safer than the more conservative approach favored by the rest of the world. I think generally uh, the average American looks at the Autobahn as, you know, Germany's way of population control. And ultimately, if you look at it statistically, it's very safe to drive on the Autobahn, and especially the last 10, 15 years, it's scored consistently a lower death rate than our American interstate. But how is this possible? One can't help but think on the face of it that a freeway on which people can go 212 would be incredibly dangerous. Not so. In exchange for the right to fly, Autobahn drivers have to sacrifice other freedoms. The Germans uh, permit much higher speeds, but uh, force uh, much more rigid controls in how you behave on the highways in terms of lane discipline. Here, you can meander all over all the lanes that, uh, wherever you want to go, provided you drive within the posted limits. They have a law that they call, it's Rechtsfahren, drive right. You can only drive in the right-hand lane and pass in the left. And that's the law. If you pass on the right, you can be pulled over and given a ticket. And so everybody rigidly observes this. So the slower traffic is always to the right, and there's never a, a left lane bandit or a slowpoke sitting in the left lane blocking traffic. Autobahn drivers don't just drive right. They drive with a distinctive concentration and focus, one that 100 plus miles an hour has a way of quickly inducing. There is no multitasking on the Autobahn, no talking on the cell phone, no eating on the run. German companies never understood why we needed cup holders, because driving is an activity in itself. One takes pride and, and has to put full concentration in driving. It's not something you do while slurping on a 7-up, as we Americans. I mean, that, that whole idea of, of the cup holder, in a way, illustrates the difference between the way the automobile in the United States is wrapped into the very fabric of everyday life, eating and drinking whereas it's an important part of German life, but it is pursued almost for its own sake. Another factor that makes the Autobahn safe at any speed is the road itself. The Autobahn is more than twice as thick as the American interstate, 27 inches of asphalt and concrete, which prevents cracking. And maintenance is extraordinary. When a crack does appear, the entire section of road is quickly replaced which is why maintenance slowdowns are a frequent occurrence. As a rule, the Autobahn is incredibly smooth. You can't have potholes on a road where you can drive 120 or, or faster. Structural features also make a difference, especially the double-sided crash guardrails that separate opposing lines of traffic and prevent head-on collisions. Most of the American interstate has a weaker single barrier or none at all. And it's much harder to get a driver's license here. Individual driver's training is mandatory. And the license itself, which you have to be 18 to get, costs between $1,500 and $2,000. A key feature of the Autobahn safety net, of course, is the quality of German cars. Cars designed from the 1930s on, with the Autobahn in mind. Cars that can go incredibly fast, but that are also beautifully maneuverable at extreme speeds. And as this footage shot by the German Highway Patrol illustrates, cars that can save a life at any speed. I would credit the unlimited speed limits of the German Autobahns 
of not only creating very highly engineered and effective automobiles, but very safe automobiles. The suspensions, the gearboxes, the brakes, the steering, the lights, the structure of these cars uh, became the best in the world in many ways because they were tested in the crucible of high-speed running on a German Autobahn. That environment is increasingly threatened. At one time, there wasn't a single speed sign on the Autobahn. Now, with urban sprawl and 50 million German trucks and cars, nearly half of the Autobahn is heavily signed. But outside the major cities, the Autobahn still affords plenty of opportunities for ordinary drivers to open up an experience of freedom of the road that the rest of the world can only fantasize about. 100, 110 miles an hour is perfectly easy to do and uh, very, very comfortable and uh, I find it uh, about the, the normal speed. Although, if you're driving 100 miles an hour in Germany on the open autobahn, you better watch your rear view mirror and stay right because you may find a BMW or a Mercedes or a Porsche go by at as much as 130, 140 miles an hour. The first time you get on the autobahn is just a, an exhilarating experience. And you see that sign the round sign with the diagonal lines through it, which is the end of speed restrictions, and you are now on a road that has no speed limit. Listening to Beethoven as you drive 110 miles an hour down the Autobahn is just one of the life-affirming experiences that you can have if you're a car buff. You're supposed to test your car, test yourself, drive fast. Get places, of course, fast. The road is somewhat of an adventure, and I think it was designed to be that from the very beginning. An adventure that had its roots in the deadliest hour of German history. Up next, the origins of what was once officially known as Adolf Hitler's road. There are 0.72 fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled on the Autobahn, compared to 0.84 on the U.S. interstate. The Autobahn will return on Modern Marvels. We now return to the Autobahn on Modern Marvels. The Autobahn is one of the most beautifully groomed highways in the world. It looks like it was built yesterday, a state-of-the-art road for state-of-the-art cars. But the Autobahn is actually the oldest national freeway system in the world. Its roots go back to Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich. In fact, until the end of World War II, the Autobahn's official name was Die Straßen Adolf Hitlers, or Adolf Hitler's Road. Built between 1933 and 1942, the Autobahn was the largest and most triumphantly publicized public works project of the Nazi regime. It put hundreds of thousands of people to work, made blitzkrieg military movements possible, and served as a symbol of the new Germany, the Germany that could get things done. A high Nazi official is quoted as saying that everything in Germany in the 30s had to move at 100 miles per hour, and therefore you needed the Autobahns. Germany could project itself to its people and to the rest of the world as a country on the move, moving into the future faster than anyone else. This was reflected in the streamlined cars, it was reflected in the curves of the Autobahns. The myth about Adolf Hitler's road was that Hitler himself came up with the idea for a high-speed, cars-only freeway while serving a five-year jail term for the failed Beer Hall Putsch in Munich in 1923. In fact, German engineers had developed the basic paradigm for the modern freeway when they began designing experimental limited access roads for Berlin and other cities in 1913. The elements of that are so familiar to us today, it's worthy to repeat that they were inventions at one time. That is, dividing traffic with a median in both directions, having at least two lanes so that the faster traffic can pass the slower traffic and having pavement that is uh, solid and curves that are banked and designed in a sufficient radius for the handling of the vehicle. At first, the National Socialist Party attacked the Autobahn as an elitist extravagance that would only benefit the tiny percentage of Germans who owned cars. 
But that changed when Hitler came to power and grasped its political, social, propagandistic, and imperial value. It was understood they would extend to what Hitler called Greater Germany, and that meant the parts of Europe he was planning to take over. So the one that ran to the east would eventually go all the way to Moscow. And uh, the Autobahns, as the roads had been for the Roman Empire, were to be the skeleton for this new great German Empire, the Third Reich. Groundbreaking on the Reich's Autobahn took place on September 23, 1933, just south of Frankfurt. Hitler himself wielded the shovel on the planned 6,900 kilometer or 4,300 mile network of roads. Within months, 130,000 unemployed Germans, many of them white collar workers from cities, were handed shovels and sent to the countryside to live in work camps and clear land. Virtually all of the initial work was done by hand, partly because the Germans didn't possess road clearing technology, partly because Nazi ideology glorified the virtues of manual labor. The people who actually did the construction um, very frequently idealized in the propaganda and the wonderful pictures of these bronzed workers uh, heroically struggling. Uh, it was actually a fairly miserable job. When the weather was good, they would work them not just eight hours a day, but 10 or 12 hours a day. A lot of people simply weren't in shape for this sort of thing. They weren't you know, construction guys. They were office people and factory people, and then all of a sudden now they're out in the elements. They had strikes in 1934 in some of the camps, and the Nazis came down very hard on them. They sent, I mean, they sent the Gestapo, and they wanted to know who was a former communist, who was a troublemaker. Some workers were so shocked by conditions, they sent naive letters to Hitler. Mein Führer, if only you knew, they wrote. The letters were turned over to the Gestapo, which opened files on the men who wrote them. Land clearing was particularly difficult because Fritz Tott, the man Hitler put in charge of construction, wanted the Autobahn to be both utilitarian and beautiful, a showcase for the glories of German landscape and culture. The evils of National Socialism, curiously, were not at odds with a passionate love of a scenic drive. Germans have always been tremendously romantic about nature in every way, and they very much envision that the Autobahns would be roads that would be at home in the landscape. There are many propaganda posters that show uh, the sort of lovely vistas from uh, the curves or high points on the Autobahn. And all this at a time that slave laborers were being used in the uh, war factories and uh, people were being rounded up into camps. So it was a very bizarre and paranoid and ultimately schizophrenic vision. Bridges were a big part of the Autobahn vision. More than a thousand bridges, including monumental suspension and arch spans. Nearly a third of the cost of the Autobahn went into bridge construction. Some of the earliest ones uh, were built of steel but after 1936, with rearmament, steel was in short supply, so they wanted to use more stonework. And they designed and built some very spectacular, I mean, the greatest stone bridges since the Romans. Um, great viaducts across valleys, all, all stonework, which no one's ever done since. The first stretch of Autobahn, a 37-mile strip from Frankfurt to Darmstadt, was opened to traffic on May 19, 1935. Hitler presided over the ribbon cutting. It would serve as a prototype for the rest of the system. An elegant double lane highway divided by a narrow median strip. The highway itself was made of concrete with cobblestone entry ramps and overpasses at regular intervals. The overpass was a key innovation that made the Autobahn and the modern speedway really fast. Well, the great enemy of speed in an automobile is the stop sign and the stoplight. The idea of the Autobahn was that you never had to stop, therefore we have the cloverleaf board, the overpass, the on-ramp and the off-ramps, all those things that we take so much for granted as, as part of normal divided highways. But that was a very new idea. From the start, the new roads were designed for speed. Original specs assumed an upper limit of 100 miles per hour which made posted speed limits unnecessary, since virtually no cars could drive that fast. Grades were limited to 7%, percent 
which meant they could rise or fall no more than seven feet in any 100-foot stretch. And curves were extremely gentle and long, so that drivers barely had to touch the steering wheel and never had to slow down. The Germans were eager to showcase their innovative new speedway, and the Autobahn made a striking impression. Foreign visitors uh, who were brought in and given tours, and many of them in, carried over the Autobahn system in Zeppelins or driven along in high-speed vehicles, were amazed. And they would comment, for instance, that they were able to sit and take notes at 80 or 90 miles an hour. And this was the first that most people in other parts of the world had heard of the idea of a modern high-speed automobile highway. Ironically, the most modern, sleek, ambitious, beautiful, and expensive freeway system in the world was virtually empty most of the time. Just one in 75 Germans owned a car in 1936, and the Autobahn carried, on average, less than a single car per minute per kilometer. Hitler sought to remedy the problem by commissioning Ferdinand Porsche to design a car that ordinary Germans could drive on the Autobahn. The Volkswagen, which would sell for just $360, went into production in 1938. But only 800 vehicles were finished when war broke out and the factory was closed. The Volkswagen wasn't the only car designed for the Autobahn. Other models were built for luxury and speed. Like this Autobahn wagon, built by Adler Automotive in 1936. Actual racing cars could also sometimes be seen flying along the speedway. In 1938, Rudy Caracciola set a world speed mark of 268.9 miles per hour on a stretch of Autobahn outside Stuttgart. Normally, record speed runs are made on broad expanses of flat land, but Hitler insisted on using the 24.6 foot wide Autobahn. Caracciola, who survived it, later said that it was like aiming down the barrel of a gun. At 270 miles an hour, the overpasses would come up uh, every, uh, every few seconds, so that the skill levels to drive a car that fast in 1937 was, uh, was, was miraculous. Later that day, Bernd Rosemeyer, Germany's most celebrated racer, attempted to top Caracciola with disastrous results. He was hit by a crosswind at an estimated 270 miles an hour, and the car was blown off the Autobahn, tumbled four or five hundred yards, shredded itself into a thousand pieces, and uh, Rosemeyer was killed. Um, that ended uh, any record attempts on the Autobahn. The race to complete the Autobahn, however, continued at a grueling pace. By May 1939, 3,000 kilometers of Autobahn were ready for traffic. Ideology had now given way to technology, and most Autobahn work was done with machines. They could design the machinery because all the roads were exactly the same size, so they built a very efficient construction train of, of various machines all going along, uh, clearing the land and, and putting stuff down, then laying the different stages of the pavement, and it was all uh, very efficiently done. Construction tailed off abruptly as Germany geared up for war and only a few hundred miles were added by 1942 when work on the Autobahn came to a standstill. As a military speedway, the Autobahn proved to be of little value, although propaganda pictures suggested otherwise. The rails were actually more efficient for moving equipment and troops since they extended farther beyond German borders. As the war turned desperate, however, the Autobahn did play an unexpected role. Oddly enough, they were used as, as uh, airports. The, uh, the Germans hid fighter planes in the woods nearby, uh, came out, closed the highway, and used them as landing and takeoff strips. And uh, there were about 30 sites all around Germany that there were different uh, emergency airports. Ironically, the Autobahn proved to be very useful to American GIs who rolled through Germany in 1944 on the world's best roads. By the end of the war, the Autobahn was heavily damaged, not by the Allies, but by the retreating Germans who blew up virtually all the bridges that had so recently and painstakingly been built. Remarkably, the bridges would soon be built up again, along with the rest of the Autobahn. 
Next, the famous freeway paves the way to post-war reconstruction. With labor in short supply during the war, the Germans used prisoners of war and forced labor to construct Autobahn extensions in Poland and Eastern Europe. The Autobahn will return on Modern Marvels. In the aftermath of defeat in World War II, the Autobahn finally proved useful to ordinary Germans. Most of the vehicles on the Autobahn were military, American military. German drivers didn't reappear until the early 1950s. By then, the country had splintered into East and West Germany. In the West, the Volkswagen, which had been shelved during the war, re-emerged as the symbol of post-war recovery. Both the car and the Autobahn were taking on new meaning. The Autobahns have a post-war symbolism, too. It's not so much an official orchestrated thing as it was in the 30s. It becomes somewhat of a consumer symbol. that Everybody had their Volkswagen and they want to go someplace. It was like, you know, we want cars, we want roads, we want to be like the Americans. With one exception, the Germans still wanted to drive on the Autobahn as fast as possible. Posted speed limits were non-existent and gradients were lowered from a pre-war maximum of 7% to just 4% so the drivers wouldn't slow down going uphill. The speed challenge of the Autobahn, meanwhile, was a big influence on car design, along with the price of gas. Fuel economy would also be a consideration for the German auto industry to build cars that are both fuel efficient and high performance. That's why you wound up with these little, you know, Porsches with these tiny little motors that would scream down the Autobahn at 100 miles per hour. Plus, the need for high speed stability, very tight suspensions and steering, good tires and brakes. All of these technological advancements showed up in mass in Europe first. By the mid-1950s, most of the pre-war Autobahn in West Germany had been restored and the West German government began the first of three four-year plans to build major extensions and new roads. They came out with what you would call the modern version of the German Autobahn, where you had a hard shoulder, the driving lanes, the center median with a continuous double guardrail. The early Autobahn with no guardrail, you could jump over that and have a gruesome crash. Intriguingly, as Autobahn expansion was underway, America began building the 44,000-mile interstate, the largest road system of all time. President Eisenhower, who had seen the Autobahn firsthand as commander of Allied forces in Europe, was the prime mover behind the interstate, which modeled itself heavily on the Autobahn. Like the Autobahn, Eisenhower sold the interstate as a national defense highway that could move American weapons and troops and that could serve as an escape route in case of a nuclear attack. One major difference, of course, was in the area of speed. With the exception of a handful of western states, the interstate was built with limits, usually between 65 and 75 miles an hour. One reason that our highways came to have speed limits was that they were regulated by local authorities. We did not have a federal system as the Autobahns were. But at the same time, also, there were differences in automobile technology. While Cadillac at that point was calling itself the standard of the world, it did not have a lot of the technical innovations that Mercedes, BMW, and even less expensive German cars had incorporated decades before. The interstate wasn't just slower than the Autobahn, it was cheaper. With over 40,000 miles of roadway to construct, engineers opted for a thinner, 11-inch roadbed that would begin to break down after 20 years. The 27-inch Autobahn was built to last twice as long. American engineers also favored what seemed like a no-frills, utilitarian design for the interstate, with as many straight lines as possible. So the lesson of that uh the highway was brought home almost immediately as drivers began to suffer from what was called highway hypnosis. Straight highways, it turned out, would put drivers to sleep. So it turned out that the curves, what, the things that seemed simply aesthetics when they were designed in the Autobahns uh, in Germany to fit the landscape, were uh, also very useful for safety. Safety became a major concern as the volume of traffic rose. 
By 1970, there were 14 million cars in West Germany and 19,000 fatalities a year. Many of the most gruesome, of course, on Germany's fastest road. Authorities raised fines and added jail time for drunk driving, hit and run, and other traffic violations, made seatbelt use mandatory, and eventually posted a suggested nationwide speed limit of 130 kilometers, or 81 miles an hour. Meanwhile, the Autobahn continued to grow. The 1970s saw a level of expansion equal to that of the 30s, with more than 3,000 kilometers added to the highway web. Planners wanted to put an Autobahn entry road within 10 kilometers of any point in Germany. By 1990, the Autobahn had grown to more than 11,000 kilometers, four times the amount that had been built before the war. A growing number of Germans began to see the Autobahn not as a national icon, but as a sprawling monster spewing pollution and choking the land. Next, managing that monster, balancing the high-speed expectations of millions of drivers against the creeping reality of the Autobahn at rush hour. A national speed limit of 100 kilometers per hour, about 63 miles per hour, was imposed on the Autobahn on November 24, 1973 during the oil crisis. It lasted less than four months. The Autobahn will return on Modern Marvels. Although speed has made the Autobahn famous, the reality of Autobahn driving can be anything but fast. Many sections of the Autobahn are like rush hour in Chicago or LA. And since the early 1990s, German authorities have employed a sophisticated system of high-tech surveillance and feedback to keep things flowing and they have imposed speed limits. Variable speed limits that change according to the conditions of the road. The idea is to overcome this bottleneck with a system like this that limit the speed for a certain time during the urban uh, areas to a synchronized traffic of 100 kilometers per hour, 120 if possible. The speed limits and other driving directives are triggered by sensors in and on the Autobahn that shoot weather and traffic data to roadside computers every 60 seconds. When, for example, the sensors determine that over 15% of Autobahn traffic is trucks and that speeds have slowed to 80 kilometers an hour, a no-passing symbol for trucks is flashed on the overhead signs. Speed limits are introduced gradually, five miles in advance of an actual slowdown, so the cars don't fly headlong into a massive jam. It's an effective system. We had a reduction of accidents in the first three years of roughly 30%. There's no better view of just how slow the world's fastest freeway system can get than here, the traffic control center for southern Bavaria. Over 220 cameras monitor traffic on the Autobahn around Munich, especially in tunnels and over bridges. On the screen and on the video, we have mostly very dense traffic, so the high-speed drivers have no chance <laughs> to, to drive as high as they like to do. The best way to ease Autobahn congestion is to free up the emergency or breakdown lane for trucks. Before that can happen, operators have to make sure there aren't any stalled cars on the shoulder of the road. Remote control cameras that can film 500 yards or two and a half football fields away swivel and scan. Adding an extra lane speeds up traffic by 70 to 80 percent. Cameras, it turns out, are everywhere on the Autobahn. Not all of them so benign. The German Highway Patrol or Polizei use them in undercover vehicles including motorcycles, which also have a VCR player that brings disputes about violations to a quick end. There is no disagreement. The violation is on video and can be used as evidence in court. If there is a speed limit, the Polizei go after speeders. But most of their attention goes to tailgaters, the number one cause of accidents on the Autobahn. 
An undercover cop in this van is operating cameras off to the side of an Autobahn overpass. Two of the cameras are on at all times, using a series of white lines 50 meters apart to measure the distance between cars and identify tailgaters. Officer Michael Piguet watches the footage and when he spots a violator, triggers a third camera, which is low enough to film the face and license plate of the driver. I see the tailgater here. I switch the camera. And I see the number. And the driver. That's all. Fines vary according to the wealth of the driver. Horst Hoblowitz, chief of the Holzkirchen Polizei south of Munich, last year ticketed one very wealthy tailgater for $20,000. Tailgating is hardly the only thing that can bring trouble on the Autobahn. Hostile gestures, like these from a 1950s driver's training film, aren't just frowned upon, they're against the law. Well, there is this, we say, you're crazy, you have a bird in your head, or the horses with the blinders on, or, of course, you know, this one here, the middle finger, or you're driving like an ass. The crime in Germany is called insult. And insult is prosecuted at the request of the victim or insulted person. And since we are in the crime category, the punishment is normally 800 Deutschmarks and up. Which is about $500. The Autobahn inevitably has lots of accidents just like every other major freeway in the world. Not surprisingly, here the worst accidents tend to be speed-related. This car was going too fast for its exit curve and plowed through some Autobahn shrubbery before smashing nose first into a tree. Some of the most horrific crashes are caused by the ultimate Autobahn nightmare. Geisterfahrer, ghost drivers, which is sometimes a kind of German equivalent to freeway shootings. In Deutschland versteht man unter einem Geisterfahrer. Ghost driver means a driver who drives the wrong way on the Autobahn, either into an on-ramp or at the beginning of a highway. That means he's driving alone against the flow of traffic, against all the other cars. The great majority of such terrifying misadventures are accidental. But a small number of sociopaths use the Autobahn as their chosen path of destruction. I especially remember one case about five weeks ago. The police officers tried everything to get the attention of the ghost driver, but nothing worked. In the meantime, ten accidents had already occurred in which drivers had swerved out of the way. After about 10 kilometers, the ghost driver collided with a big automobile. The car of the ghost driver flipped over and the ghost driver died. That was the last recent experience our station had with a ghost driver. Kind of makes you want to stay on the interstate, doesn't it? But America too has roads that lend themselves to kamikaze driving. Up next, Montana and the American Autobahn. It is illegal to run out of gas on the Autobahn. The Autobahn will return on Modern Marvels. Germany isn't the only place in the world where a motorist can be upstaged at any speed. Until the oil crisis of the early 1970s, the Autostrada in Italy was the world's other great speeder's paradise, with no posted limits of any kind. Since then, the limit has been 85 miles per hour, although that's scheduled to go up to 150 kilometers, or 94 miles per hour in 2003. I suppose that you could say that the speed limits are, uh, are loosely enforced, although 
you will find lane discipline every bit as good uh, in, in Italy on the autostradas as you, in my opinion, as you will be in, in Germany. Until a few years ago, an American Autobahn of sorts also gave Germany a run for the races. From the 1950s to 1975, when the national 55 mile per hour law was imposed, the state of Montana was another speeding sanctuary. Drivers could go as fast as they pleased, so long as their speed was reasonable and prudent for road conditions. Montana returned to a free-for-all approach in 1995. After three years and a lot of really crazy driving, the state reversed itself again and fixed the speed limit at 75 miles per hour. Ironically, uh, one of the reasons was that Germans were coming from Germany to Montana to enjoy the uh, total lack of speed limits and, and long distances that increased congestion had made harder to find in Germany. Germany's Autobahn, of course, is more than a matter of speed signs, and it's doubtful that Americans are willing to do what it takes to make one work. To have a, a real American Autobahn, which would be similar to the German Autobahn, requires a you know, a total rethinking of how Americans drive, that you need to be willing to pay for this very expensive infrastructure to have this beautiful road uh, that is properly maintained. And then the attitude that, all right, I will, you know, change my driving behavior to help make that road safe. While Germany has the mentality and the infrastructure to handle the give and take that an Autobahn demands, it may not have the political will The German Green Party has led a campaign for national speed limits, arguing that the Autobahn is destroying Germany's beloved forest land. Most cars use twice as much gas at 120 miles per hour than they do at 60 miles per hour. It's a, a very, you know, interesting cultural struggle because there are these two mystiques in Germany. There is, you know, the Autobahn and the ability to cut loose and drive as fast as you want, and then there's also the, the tremendous love and mystical quality of, you know, the Black Forest. And really, many people thought that a speed limit would be imposed, and they felt that the only reason it might ever happen is because people loved the forest more than they loved the fast driving on the Autobahn. As traffic increases, as Germany becomes more integrated with the rest of Europe through the road system, then the Autobahns are bound to slow down. Uh, and this grand vision of the past will become something like a nostalgic ideal. We're likely to see the Autobahns become in many ways much more like the interstates. So uh, that guy in his uh, S-Class Mercedes beaming down on the guy in front of him may have no choice. There may be nowhere for the fella to move over. And yet, it's hard to imagine Germany giving up one of its most distinctive features, a tiny sphere of outrageous abandon in a society and culture that is otherwise notoriously constrained. Free roads for free citizens is the rallying cry of the Autobahn speed lobby, which in Germany has the passion and deep funding of the gun lobby in the U.S. I think the fast drivers of Germany will ultimately prevail. They have made a very safe road that is very fast, very well maintained, and it does have this cultural mystique about it. I think the average German would be very sad the day that a bona fide speed limit is enforced on the Autobahn. It would be a, a real loss of their cultural identity and of the fantasy identity of armchair speedsters all over the world who have no other freeway on which they can find out just how far this speedometer will go. Next on Full Throttle, the mid-80s saw a serious lack of muscle car fever in America. So Buick came out with this mean-looking beauty. <laughs> Two teams muscle their way under the hood and settle on the racetrack. It was mean in 85 and it's still mean today. 1985 Buick Grand National, next on the History Channel. You thought you knew what the fast lane was. Think again. Imagine a super highway designed for speed. Thousands of miles of roadway unhindered by limits of any kind. 
where drivers can go as fast as their Porsches will carry them. Now, the Autobahn on Modern Marvels. Speed. It's dangerous, exhilarating, intoxicating, and illegal beyond clearly set limits that are posted on every major highway in the world, except one. It's midnight at a gas station just off the German Autobahn in southern Bavaria. We are about to live out every armchair speedster's fantasy to push the needle on the speedometer as far as it will go. In this car, the needle's going to go pretty far. This car you see here was a car from Great Britain, and the customer brings it to us as a stock 996 Turbo with 420 horsepower, and uh, we converted this car to 520 horsepower. Hans Lieb is a test driver for Roof Automotive a boutique car company that converts high-end Porsches into the fastest street-legal cars in the world. Everything about these cars, from the low-friction tires to the super-sensitive suspension to the massive engine, has been designed for Autobahn joyrides. The roof car is definitely designed for the Autobahn because the roof car is uh, so fast that it can only be driven such speeds on the Autobahn. You cannot do that on a normal two-lane highway. Hans has to certify exactly how fast this $200,000 Porsche can go before sending it to its owner in London. The Autobahn is the ideal place and the only major highway in the world where he can legally make this kind of test run. The Autobahn for us is a good road to test all our cars. We have mostly no speed limit and also it's in a, in a really good condition. So it's really safe to test cars in this way by night. First you learn slowly to walk and then you learn faster to walk. And so it's the same impression you had with speed. Of course it's fun to go really, really fast with cars. So, but at the end you must be always really careful and all your eyes must be watching all around, so also by side and also in front a little bit. At this speed, even the super smooth surface of the Autobahn, specially maintained to accommodate really fast drivers, feels rough and pitted. And the slow and gentle Autobahn curves, designed to allow drivers to reach and hold extreme speeds, strain the Porsche. The hardest part at that speed is if you see cars in front of you and you are not really sure how they react. Sometimes they are sleeping and they turning to the middle line. So you must be really sure that the line is clear and uh, that is not a car who may, can make something wrong in front of you. You must be really concentrated at at that speed, because the car runs uh, over two or three hundred meters per second. This 520 horsepower Porsche tops out at 7,200 RPMs, 